Welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of January 24th to January 30th. I'm your host, Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman, Director of Marketing for Cleveland Cinemas. And on this week's episode, we'll be discussing The Gentleman and Keller Out of Space. But first, we always like to start off on a positive note, recommending a film that you all should be seeking out and watching this week. Dave, what is your Movie of the Week recommendation this week? I caught a film that played at the Cleveland International Film Festival last year that one of my good friends told me I had to see, but I continued to ignore him until just this weekend. Mm. And it was a film that IFC had wanted us to even play. And then I felt bad because I never even watched the screener they sent me. And I just want to apologize profusely to my (laughs) dear friends at IFC for not ever looking at it because I loved the movie. But it is definitely not a movie for everybody. It is called Greener Grass. Oh, I was going to guess that. Comedy. Yeah. <laughs> did you see it? At the I festival? didn't, but it had like such like an immediate kind of cult uh, <laughs> yeah. advocacy for the people that saw it. Yes. So yes, Greener and Grass. I'm I am right there for that cult. It is a, a great new comedy written, directed, and starring these two women, Jocelyn DeBoer and Don Luby. I think is how her last name is pronounced. It is just. A wonderfully surreal, weird comedy about these two suburban women, but it doesn't take an, place in any sort of reality. Like everything about it is a fantasy v- twisted version of the world, and it's just great and very original. I loved every second of it. I was laughing out loud literally within like the first minute of the movie and just laughed through the rest of it. But it is also the kind of movie that I think, depending on how well you knew somebody, you know, you either would or would not recommend it because, and I've been telling people about it since I saw it, this actually, I watched it twice over the weekend and I've been telling people like, just watch the beginning. If the first like three minute little intro before the opening title comes on, doesn't make you laugh, just don't watch the rest (laughs) of the movie because if you're not amused by the beginning, you're not going to be amused by the rest of the movie because it sets up the film and the tone and the weirdness of it actually just gets weirder as it goes on. And I loved it. So I can't wait to see whatever else they do. This was their first feature they had done. uh, I actually watched their other short film that they'd done called The Arrival, which had a similar kind of twisted sensibility, but not nearly as warped as this was. So I can't recommend it enough. And it is available to stream on Hulu. I'm not sure where else has it, but I watched it on my Hulu subscription. Nice. Uh, it did get a um, Independent Spirit Award nomination for I think best. Is it best? They do. They do best first screenplay. I think there. I think so. so yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are uh, there are some critics out there who are. Oh who are well, critically. Oh, no, critically, critically it is. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, critically, the, uh, it's got very season, good sorry. reviews. Yeah. Yeah. There's some it was uh, very season. well reviewed. Everyone except for um, uh, the New York Times, uh, Jeanette, uh, did not care for it at the New York Times. So I was uh, reading a lot of reviews on it today, and it's like, yeah, she just didn't get it. And like I said, if someone watches the first five minutes of it and they don't laugh, she should have just stopped because right, she right. just <laughs> she was not buying what they were selling. Not quite so for there her then. Okay. Yeah, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And how about you, Aaron? What was your uh, pick for the week? Uh, mine is, uh, well, we'll keep it with sort of a, an interesting comedy vein. Uh, I finally caught up with Jojo Rabbit. Oh, uh, I was excellent. disappointed when it left the theater because I have a um, uh, 13-year-old and a 9-year-old, and it's rare when you get a PG-13 movie at the art house that you mm-hmm. can kind of share with the younger younger crowd, and that one seemed like it also mainly because the main character, you know, it's it's told from the child's perspective, right. so it wasn't like I was taking him to see Room or something that, you know, <laughs> child's right. perspective, but definitely rated R. This was a child's perspective, World War II, rated PG-13, and um, I thought he struck a really interesting tonal balance shifting mm-hmm. back and forth like you you'd mentioned before and other critics have said as well you know between the comedy and the horrors of world war 2 but i think in maintaining the, the the child's perspective really helped for me but also i was definitely my my view of the movie was colored by having two children watching it with me right um one of which uh was really Really loving the, oh, that's a weird sentence to say. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> really loving the fictional Hitler portrayal. <laughs> uh, the scenes of Hitler. Yeah, that is a weird sentence to say. That, you know, yeah, your kid really loved Hitler. Right, that, no, that no, movie. no, no, no. The yeah, fictional yeah. Taika Waititi <laughs> version, um, which it is. I mean, it's played for laughs and it is really, right. really funny. Um, and then uh, my younger one, uh, you know, there's some, you know, moments of uh, intense drama mixed in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't dislike it, but it, it was it was emotionally affecting her the way it's supposed to. Gotcha. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's uh, it's got some heart to it, and it's got um, some tragedy and some drama in there. And uh, you know, she was reacting accordingly. I think as a nine year old, though, maybe you just want to go escape a bit more at the theater than see some of the weightier mm-hmm. stuff that her film geek dad makes her watch on occasion. <laughs> but uh, 
No, they and both responded but, to it, and uh, with the the caveat of uh, they're allowed to pick the next movie because um, gotcha. you know, they enjoy the the thrill right of going to the movies, not necessarily a. And what if they pick cats? Uh, that is just off the table. So that's <laughs> that's that's not going to happen. Uh, even ironic watches. We're not quite there yet. Although my oldest, my my son who's thirteen, he likes mystery science theater quite a bit. Um, I don't want to yeah. be the person who gets kicked out of the theater because we're mystery right. science theater in the current film that's out in in the theater. But um, I don't know. the The audience that we saw it with though um, was definitely feeling it. You know, it's our house audience, so there was some mm-hmm. uh, applause at the end and whatnot. But um, I kind of, I'm kind of a little bummed that I didn't see it right away with a larger crowd because there weren't a ton of people at the screening we were at. You know, maybe sure. like a, a dozen or so. Um, so I think that type of movie being as comedic as it is and oh, the, the timing that um, Taika Waititi has with just his performance specifically, but also like the way he edits this film, I think is really interesting. All of his films really too. Like he uses editing in a very comedic way as another kind of tool in his uh, comedic arsenal. Um, but seeing it with a, bi- a bigger crowd, I think would have been definitely the way to go. And I was glad to well, see it back I- in theaters. I think I told you that I watched it uh, at the screening that was at the Jewish Film Festival, the advanced screening they had. Oh yeah, and it was a it was a packed house, and I felt like I was there was me and one other person that was really laughing a lot in there. Oh and yeah. So, <laughs> so normally I always tell like a comedy really helps, but for the big crowd, but that one was I was almost feeling like awkward because it is true like sometimes certain people don't feel comfortable laughing at some of the subject matter in that movie. Yeah. And I had to kind of like and I'm sitting there being respectful at the Jewish Film Festival, but then I had to I actually actually went through this whole mental process of myself i'm like well wait a minute hitler was killing gay people too so you right, know right, right. i was i was on his list so i'm allowed to laugh so uh yeah it was uh it was a very you know interesting weird balance that he struck and i thought he did a great job so yeah. i'm happy to see that it got the nominations that yeah it did. absolutely Mm-hmm. And it's not it's no small feat either. Um, uh, we all, I rewatched uh, Parasite this weekend as well. And so I was kind of thinking of um, also Joker, actually. So mm-hmm. there is an interesting mix of some of the, the, the movies that have really risen to the top of the Academy's list for the year that kind of uh, I'll focus a bit more on Parasite because I don't care for Joker as much. But Parasite and Jojo Rabbit, where there is an interesting balance being struck of um, hopping genres or having a little comedy and then also um uh, you know, having some drama in there, and it, and it is tough for Waters to navigate. But I think both of those films do it very well. Yeah. I think Parasite does it better, but um, that's not to dismiss Jojo Rabbit at all. Absolutely. But well, on to new things this week, Dave. We've got uh, the new film from Guy Ritchie coming to the theater, The Gentleman. Uh, this is a British drug lord tries to sell off his highly profitable empire to a dynasty of Oklahoma billionaires. I want you to play a game with me, Ray. I don't want to play a game. Oh, please. No. I said, play a game with me, Raymond. Right. Lovely. I want you to imagine a character. Your boss, Mickey Pearson. You're too smart to be blackmailing us, Fletcher. Yeah. Sweet Mary Jane is my vice. Your poison, on the other hand, is and always has been the destroyer of worlds. You're out of touch, and I would like you to consider an offer. I am not for sale. The plot begins to thicken. Now, I can't be specific about the heroes and zeros, but our protagonist is a hungry animal. (laughs) There is a lot of money hanging in the balance. Our antagonist explodes on the scene like a millennial firework. So, Dave, what brings a Guy Ritchie film uh, after all these years back to the art house? Yeah, I was going to say he, he. This is a filmmaker who you know started his career at you the know, art with house. Lock, Stock, yeah, yeah. Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch. These were you know staples of the art house for for and years, hits. and then he became yeah, and yeah. hits too, yeah. And then he you know absolutely became a very mainstream filmmaker. You know the Sherlock Holmes films, and uh, he just did Aladdin last year. And now, you know, he's returning back to his sort of, you know, London gangster, you know, art house genre, if you will. And it's getting he's actually I think this might be getting the best reviews of his career since Lockstock. So I'm excited to see this one. I haven't got a chance to see it. It's got an amazing cast with Matthew McConaughey and Colin Farrell and um, just uh, and Hugh Grant. So it's just got a huge cast of people just uh, and I can't wait to see it. Do you have a a, um, a favorite of his? I've, I know you you said I don't know if you said on the podcast before you did catch up with Aladdin and enjoyed it for the genre that it is. But yeah, Aladdin was fine. Aladdin is like total fine, like 
Lifetime Killing Entertainment for what it is. Yeah. No, my favorite of his movies is probably, I love Snatch. Um, and I love Snatch for two reasons. The main reason, though, aside from the movie just being entertaining, it was one of the first movies that I actually saw actually in London when I was there years ah. ago uh, on w- one of my first trips. And uh, it was just a really awesome experience, sure. just like seeing that movie in London with an audience. It was just a great kind of perfect experience to, for uh, for seeing that. I was, uh, this movie is not very highly rated as far as critics go. I'm just checking right now on IMDb. It's 25 on Metacritic, so yikes. Uh, but a buddy of mine uh, constantly recommended Revolver from 2005 that he did. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Is, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. He's also a big Luke Besson fan, and I know he mm-hmm. he worked on the script a little bit for that one, so I think that probably helped a little bit. But uh, Jason Statham, I like a, a, a scene-chewing Ray Liotta as much as the next guy, and he <laughs> chews a lot in that one. Uh, but it also was just kind of a fun, fun story that um, I thought was interesting. After that, he uh, went the, the Sherlock Holmes route, and I was like, okay, I guess that's where he's going with his career now, but... Hopefully, with the gentleman, well, it seems like he's kind of marrying uh, both both aspects of his yeah. filmmaking career so far together. I really enjoyed the Sherlock Holmes movies, but then that same kind of you know flashy style that he had in those that worked when he did his King Arthur Legend of the Sword. That movie oh, was just that one. yeah. It is. It was literally one of my least favorite movies of the decade. So I just uh, you know he had to redeem himself quite a bit from right. that. And <laughs> <laughs> That's an but he's obviously a talented filmmaker. Just that movie was. Who, they they just was like it was just visual noise all the time. It was just it was not good. Between that and like Sherlock Holmes uh, as two movies as well, like that's an interesting period of his filmmaking career that was like um, UK like legends, I guess you know fictional yeah. folklore. Mm-hmm. Um, well, not, yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure his version of King Arthur is quite quite fictional, <laughs> fictional version. <laughs> uh, extremely, extremely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then back with um, like you said, Matthew McConaughey starring in a, a new kind of overlapping narrative uh, gangster, you know, British gangster yeah. drama again, like maybe. Uh, this one just looks like a lot of fun. And I know John Foreman, uh, our, my boss here at the, at, at the Cedar Lee, he did get to see it. He went to an advanced screening of that and just really loved it. He thought it was a lot of fun. So uh, he's, you know, championing and making sure that we brought it to the Cedar Lee because it was a film that he personally really enjoyed well so speaking of seeing movies with uh, a crowd at a theater too i would imagine um the gentleman would be a lot more fun with a packed house than Absolutely. watching it you know again yeah. god forbid on your phone like <laughs> on the commuter somewhere uh in in a few months once it's uh once it's out streaming and speaking of movies that are going to be a lot more fun to watch on the big screen with the crowd uh, we're going to be opening up color out of space uh, the new film co-written and directed by Richard Stanley. This is a limited engagement, so it's probably only going to be here from one week. So if you want to check it out, come and see it. And this is the new film. It's based on an H.P. Lovecraft story, and it stars Nicolas Cage. It's about a meteorite that crashes in someone's backyard and, you know, alien uh, shenanigans uh, ensue, is all I'll say. But it's it's a lot of fun. And everything just blew up. Big flash, like a pink light. Or actually, I don't even know what color it was. It wasn't like any color I'd ever seen before. Looks like a meteorite. You mean it's radioactive? I mean, it's from space, right? Meteorites are generally no more dangerous than ordinary rocks. How can something that big just disappear? Did you plant those? No. Ward, you come here for a sec. Oh, God. What are you doing? Shh. It's talking to me. Who's talking to you? A man in the well. So, uh, alien shenanigans ensue. Was that, did you get that from the poster, <laughs> Dave, or was that? <laughs> no, that is, that is my own personal oh, okay. review. This, it's by the same people that produced uh, Mandy, uh, you know, the extremely well-received uh, Nicolas Cage movie that we played uh, a year and a half ago or so. Mm-hmm. And it is, has a, sim- a similar kind of vibe to it, even though it's a different director. This is uh, Richard Stanley, who is kind of a cult filmmaker that hasn't done a lot of films lately. He did um, Hardware, which is a total cult movie from oh, yeah. the early 90s. And uh, so it's kind of a return to form for him putting a movie back out into the theaters first off and also just working with Nicolas Cage who does just the best level of like scenery chewing in that Nicolas Cage way that you want in something like this. This is a great science fiction horror movie that's got, um, you know, some good gore effects, but it's not just about that. It's, uh, you know, it is really visually a beautiful movie that would be great to see on the big screen. 
He uh, always stays in my head because the the infamous behind the scenes story that's far more interesting to the uh, 90s remake of Island of Dr. Moreau. Uh, he was <laughs> yes. he was famously fired. I think it was like once it was already filming, uh, too. Like mm-hmm. that was a project that yeah. he really wanted to work on. And knowing him from uh, mainly just from hardware, I haven't seen this one yet, but it seemed like Island of Dr. Moreau is totally this guy's made for that one. Like the mix of practical effects, the sci-fi, mm-hmm. the horror, the body horror that you'd get with the Island of Dr. Moreau. So unfortunately we never got to see his, what he would have done with Dr. Moreau, but that, that just wasn't in the cards based on how that movie was put yeah. together uh, ahead of time. But still it's a fascinating uh, train wreck to read about and his role. And it's pretty, pretty good. Interesting. Uh, another thing I want to mention about this movie is got uh, some great supporting people that are familiar faces like Jolie Richardson and Tommy oh, yeah. Chong is in this as Tommy Chong plays the kind of like, not hermit, but, you know, this guy that lives kind of in this shack and on the property in the back, you know, he's kind of this, oddly enough, kind of a hippie guy. You so, don't say. <laughs> yeah. Tommy Chong but playing against type Tommy for Chong, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's all about uh, the moments this meteorite hits, uh, the way it's affecting every living thing around it. And, uh, you know, um, plant life, human life, animal life. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a really good, creepy movie. It's got H.P. Lovecraft all over it. Excellent. Well, we will be right back with the special events this week here at the theater. Well, special events are a bigger and bigger portion of the modern theatrical programming, and we like to keep you up to speed with all of those special events that are happening at the theater this week. The first one that we've got coming up here at the Cedar Lee, really it's our only special event here at the Cedar Lee this week, which is extremely unusual for us, is a special live event from the Sundance Film Festival on Sunday, January 26th at 8.30 p.m. We're going to have an advanced screening of a film called The Climb, which is a new indie comedy that uh, about these two friends who, you know, the the one man has slept with the other man's wife, and it's about the kind of conflict that comes from that. And we're going to have that special advance show of it, and it's also going to have a live introduction from the Sundance Film Festival, as well as a post-screening Q&A. And we're only one of 10 uh, theaters in the entire country that are doing this, so it's a very special event. So if you want to kind of, if you've always wondered, what does the Sundance Film Festival look like, this is a way to participate in the Sundance Film Festival without having to go all the way out to Utah. So... Come on over to the Cedar Lee uh, at 8.30 on Sunday, January 26th. I really hope this trend continues because it seems like in the age of the digital uh, distribution Mm -hmm. and everything that you could have a festival, uh, not that it has to be nationwide necessarily, but have satellite places that are all screening the same thing at the same time. The Sundance Film Festival could be in like, you know, nine cities all at once. Um, Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a logistical nightmare, but I hope somebody else could tackle (laughs) that at some point because I think that would be really interesting. The way that like New York Film Festival used to like travel afterwards with certain of their titles. uh Um, you could do it all simultaneously with, uh, I don't know, satellites and technology mm-hmm. these days. And this film, uh, it is set to open at the Cedar Lee. I think we don't open it until April, I think, is when it's going to be released here. So if you come this Sunday, you're going to get to see it a few months before everybody else in Cleveland. Super advanced show, then. Nice. Super advanced. That's the official title, I'm going to say. It's a super advanced show. <laughs> Uh, we also wanted to highlight, though, just because people out at the art house, there is a classic film uh, showing across town over at the Capitol Theater, uh, part of the Happy Hour Classic Series. It is Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window, Wednesday, January 29th. Uh, this also features a cocktail party that starts at 6 p.m., and then the film follows at 7 p.m. This is uh, obviously, for those of you who don't know, one of Hitchcock's masterpieces starring uh, James Stewart about a man who thinks he witnesses a murder and spies upon his neighbor. And the film famously takes place. I think it's almost, it's almost, it's entirely in the apartment, right? I haven't seen rear window in a while. Yeah. It was all shot in a studio in a very like, yeah, that's kind of like, if you watch the original trailer for the movie, they kind of tout the way that it was shot in in the trailer, which is kind of unusual for a movie trailer to say like, this is how he filmed it. Yeah. In the era of like 1917 and like the one take wonders right now. um, I I wonder if it's going to swing back the other way and just be like, every film just takes place in one room and Mm -hmm. uh, how dramatic can the filmmakers make it? Well, very dramatic if you're Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, yeah, for sure. And <laughs> and as you mentioned, this is part of our Happy Hour Classic series that we do every month over at the Capitol Theater. So your admission is just $10, and that includes a complimentary mini cocktail, appetizers uh, before the movie, and then you get to see one of the best films ever made at 7 o'clock, all for just 10 bucks. 
Well, if you're a longtime listener uh, to Cedarly Radio and are wondering what we're doing with our Cedarly three picks, they have now moved over to our social media accounts. So head on over via the links in the show notes of this particular show, or just go over to any of our social media accounts through clevelandcinemas.com. And we've been posting kind of our countdown to the Oscars list. Uh, this week, we are posting our picks for Best Directors of 2019. So head on over if you want to check that out, or for some of our previous editions that were Best Actor, Best Actress. Uh, best foreign language film documentaries etc those are all over on the social media accounts and be sure to join us next week when as of right now we'll be discussing a few different programs that are opening we're getting the oscar shorts program so that is live action animation and documentary playing at various times on various days throughout the week and also the uh what's the new title for foreign language film (laughs) best international feature film i don't have that in my brain yet (laughs) best international feature film nominee les miserables uh the new uh uh, French film, uh, not the standard Les Mis adaptation. We'll be talking about that next week, so be sure to tune in then. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedar Lee Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.